Okay. Cough drop. Let's do the real panel now. So, how to win at games. <laughs> Now you might be thinking, why would you run a panel on how to win at games? Also, you're going to tell everyone how to win at games. This is going to be some like trap. Spend We're famous. All your money on strategy, guys. We're no. famous for making panels with provocative titles and then doing a completely different panel. So obviously, everybody wants to win the game. You think if you're playing a game, you're playing to win the game, and this is like obvious. Why would you need to say that? And you feel good when you win. Yeah. I argue I that the majority of you are not trying to win the games that you play. Not you really. You think you're trying to win. But you're not really. I mean, you're playing, you're moving your pieces around, like, all right, I'm going to win this game, I'm going to win this Counter Strike, I'm going to do this thing. But you're not, if you were really trying, you'd be winning a lot more often than you are. I know how often you're winning, it's not that often. <laughs> so, before we get into this, we really have to talk about I'm being very unprofessional and minimizing my slideshow to open something that I don't have That's in the That's going to be laggy again? My laptop's like four years old, give it a break. Alright, so let me give some context to the video you're about to watch, right? So, in the, in the 90s, right, the New York Jets, they sucked. I still hate them, but they suck less now, you have to admit, right? AFC Championship, right? But they sucked big time, like 0-2, oh man, they were terrible, right? They won so few games, right, that the fact was there was no way they could make the playoffs. And if you don't know this, right, in most sports, professional ones, the worst team gets the first draft pick the next year to help you boost you up, right? The shittiest team gets the best new players to help them become better, and the best, the team that wins the Super Bowl gets the last pick. Kind of so like how in Power Grid, if you're in last place, you get first crack at the resources. Right. So the Jets were so terrible, and after every NFL game, there's always a, a press conference, and the head coaches of both teams have to go and talk and answer questions to the press. Somebody asked Coach Herm Edwards, are you going to lose on purpose, right, so that you can get a better draft pick next year? And his response was famous. This is legendary. You might hear people play, sports people more so than nerd people, because you realize sports people are just as nerdy as all of you. They're just sports nerds. Yeah, cool. a sports nerd, they memorize every stat of every character that they follow in this competitive game. Right, hey, play right there. I gotta rewind it a little bit. All right. This is great about sports. This is what the greatest thing about sports is. You play to win the game. Hello? You play to win the game. You don't play to just play it. That's the great thing about sports. You play to win. And I don't care if you don't have any wins. You go play to win. When you start killing me, it doesn't matter. Then it's time. You get out. For the next. So, all right. That, 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 this whole conversation bothers me. You play to win the game. Unless it's apples to apples, that doesn't matter. <laughs> now, there are a lot of reasons why you want to play to win, and we'll get into all of that. So, let's start. We have to warn you, this is a dangerous panel. This is a danger zone. Oh, wait, they just watched Archer. Anyway, that's why that was in my head. So, we're going to take you to a scary place in gaming. If you stay in this room and do what we say, you're going to have some problems in the rest of your life. So pretty be much, warned. Yeah, the problems pretty much are that some of the games that you are going to play are not going to be fun anymore, right? If you just know how to win a game and so do all your friends, the game can sometimes become really, really boring. There are three fundamental traits or superpowers that you're going to acquire. But they are there with great responsibility comes great air hockey. <laughs> so the air hockey problem is very particular to games like air hockey, games where there's a high skill cap, but most people do not play them competitively. You will never see these games in the Omega Fun. Many of you might play air hockey, you know, when you're at an arcade, you're at a bar, and you're okay at it, but you're not good. Very few people practice air hockey. So if you go up to someone and say, hey, want to play air hockey? Sure, and you play, and it's a ton of fun. But we play air hockey a lot. We're really into air if hockey. If we see an air hockey table, that's actually a good one, Photon, right? It's got to be a regulation table. Yeah, if we see an air hockey table, it's down. It is on. <laughs> so the trouble here is that if you start to be good at games, your friends won't play with you anymore. How if you many people are like good at a fighting game and they have friends who aren't good at the fighting game and they just refuse to play with you, right? Because you'll just beat them and they won't even get a single hit in. Thus, it's not fun for them, yeah, right? It's lonely at the top. You also reach this problem where if you start to be good at games, you'll be better than everyone you play with in your hometown, but you won't be pro. So you'll be good enough to beat all your friends in Soul Calibur, but you can't win a tournament at PAX, so you have almost no one to play games with. So be warned, this is the path you're going down. The Bewegung Oderwehr Schlagen Sie problem. 
So this might be an apocryphal tale, but there's a German game designer who was asked in an interview at one point, your games are very popular, but a problem we see is that it takes a long time. People spend forever on their turn analyzing every possible outcome. Yeah, the famous game is Acquire, right? If you ever played Acquire, if you sit down and calculate every possible decision and which one gets you the most points in Acquire, it takes forever, especially, you know, unless you have a calculator, but even then it takes a while. But if you do that, you're going to win, right? Or at so, least you're going to have the best chance of winning. His response was, well, I'm, I'm doing a terrible accent and I'm translating from German from a story that might not even be real. What we do is we sit around and we start to chant, move or I will hit you. Move or I will hit you. And if he does not move, we hit them. They learn their lesson. <laughs> so what will happen to you is, one, you will start taking your turn, especially in board games, like that. You'll know exactly what to do every turn. And all your dumbass friends are going to sit there forever being like, uh... This happens uh, to us a lot when we go to, like, board game night and we're playing with somewhat strangers or acquaintances and they're not, like, our close friends who play board games like crazy. And, like, I'll know exactly... I'll just be thinking during everyone else's turn what I'm going to do on my turn. It gets to my turn and I'm like, click, 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 done. The and real- then eventually goes around the table and every time it gets to the one guy's turn, usually to your right, yeah. <laughs> it's like your way, you're like, I'll take a nap. Oh, it's my turn? Oh. Now, the tricky part is that there's a lot of reasons for this, and the biggest one is that a lot of decisions in games that you think matter don't matter at all. They're entirely arbitrary. And if you figure out games, you'll know when a decision doesn't matter, and you won't worry about it. You'll just pick one probably randomly. But you can tell then, you'll see the people who haven't quite figured this out. They'll be sitting there agonizing over whether to throw paper or rock. (laughs) Agonizing. Well, he might throw scissors, so I think I should... The worst problem is that you're going to see through the matrix. Settlers of Catan, done game. We've seen through it. We've solved it. We'll tell you how to solve it as an example of how this works. Almost all the board games I own, I can't play anymore because I know the solution. I know exactly how to win, what's going on. There's no fun in it anymore. I don't even make any decisions. So, we really have to lay a few ground rules, too, before we really get into this. We have to say what these words actually mean, what we're actually talking about. The biggest one is game. What is a game? I mean, patty cake is a game. Farmville is a game. Yeah, if you look in the dictionary for the word game, right? I mean, you know, it, people always say, oh, I hate to use the old dictionary cliche. But what's wrong with the dictionary cliche? It's a definition of a word, right? There it is. It's true. Go for it. Uh-huh. I think it's pretty obvious which one we're going for here. So, pheasants, right? <laughs> It's such a cheap gag, but I like that picture a lot. Why do you like the picture? So if you talk to game designers, there are kind of two, or game players, there are two definitions of game that have sort of crystallized into what we all agree upon. I don't think anyone in this room would agree that you can say a game is either a series of interesting decisions, you might say a series of meaningful decisions instead. For example, Candyland, you don't make any decisions. I guess, do I play Candyland or not? Do I, do I cheat or not? Or, and the one we want to focus on, a fair competitive test of one or more skills. All games test some sort of skill if we're going to use that definition. So we're thinking about games in terms of a competition. I'm going to bang my brain or my fist or my sword or my something against Scott's equivalent, and we're going to fight it out. Yeah, some games are just an obvious, you know, it's obvious what skill they're testing. Like, you know, running race. Well, we're testing our leg strength and, and lung power and whatever, right? But some games, like, what skill is this game testing? Patience. Patience is often the thing that is tested in many games. For example, Monopoly. Yeah. <laughs> now what about a sport? Because sports are actually very different from games in a few key areas. For example, I can tell you how to win hockey. I have a strategy. You want to hear my strategy? You want to know how to win hockey? Take the little black thing and put it in the goal. And keep doing it. Over and over again. But Notice how knowing what I'm going to do isn't the only thing that matters. Actually doing it also matters. There's a skill of doing that. Yeah, you know, if you have a board game or something like that, just knowing what you want to do. Oh, it's a board game. I want to put the biscuit in the basket. Boom, put the biscuit in the basket. I win. But if it's a sport, you actually have to be able to do it. There's some other physical difficulty. It could even be a small difficulty, right? You know, I consider like RTSs and pretty much any, even a platforming game to be a sport because there is some physical element. You might know you want, Mario just has to jump over the pit. Oh, you didn't jump over the pit because you didn't physically do it correctly. Your timing, your reaction time, your physical strength, something about you and and your body was not up to speed, and that makes it a sport. I mean, in Dance Dance Revolution, I am making meaningful decisions. I'm saying, if there's a left arrow, I'm going to step on that left one. I'm going to step on the right one. I'm going to do what the game's telling me to do. There are meaningful decisions in that regard, in that they actually, if I don't do them, I lose the game. 
but they're not interesting decisions because I think we all can identify that an arrow pointing left means left. Well, you might want to step on the left arrow with the right foot. That's a pretty advanced tactic. It is very advanced. But the key here is that the execution matters. Now, people might be saying, you know, oh, there's this element of physicality. That's what you're defining as a sport. So, I want to skip a little bit. Chess. <laughs> chess is not a sport because if I am quadriplegic, I can still play chess. I can say what my move is and someone else will move it. A robot can play chess and the tender to the robot will move the pieces for it or tell it where the pieces are on the board. You don't, you don't get more points in chess by moving the piece faster or, you know, move, or throwing the piece and having it land exactly on the right spot. Now, chess boxing, on the other hand, that's a sport. That's a sport. Now, one could argue that it is a sport because I still have to execute the calculations in my brain and, you know, constructs and causality and all that, but that's a stupid argument. Pretty much the brain is the one muscle that is exempted from the sport definition. Because otherwise everything comes down to solipsism and is meaningless. Counter-Strike is also a sport because there is strategy and tactics involved, but what really matters, what really determines who wins and who loses, is the skill at the specific test. The test here is, can I click on people's heads and avoid being clicked on my own head? <laughs> and can I do it faster than everyone else? And we can tell you how to win sports. There's a very easy formula to winning all sports. Play them a lot. Yeah. Practice. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's no way, you know, in the human body, right, if you want to move the fastest as you can move, you need to have muscle memory to where you're not even thinking, right? If you play DDR or any sort of rhythm game, right, when you're first starting out, you're actually thinking consciously, push this button, then strum the thing. Step on the arrow, but as soon as you do it for a few minutes, or maybe you know, depending on how good you are, right, or your natural talent is, eventually you're not consciously thinking. The arrows or the symbols on the screen are just controlling your body. Your muscles have the memory, and you can you know you can delegate all of that thinking to some subconscious part of your brain. It just arrows come in, feet move, and then that allows you to use your brain to think about things on a higher level, right? So, for example, when if you're playing baseball, right, and you want to be really good at it, you know, if you actually have to think about your swing and you just don't have it memorized in your muscles, then you're thinking about your swing and because you're thinking about your swing you're not thinking about other things like should I run to second base you know where's the you know what's the strategy here should I, should I bunt right but as soon as you can have your swing in your muscle memory then you can think about these strategies in the higher level you know do I want to get a sacrifice fly out to the left field and that would you know elevate you to the next level of gameplay so if you want to be better than me at counter-strike start playing counter-strike 10 years ago it applies to Street Fighter. It applies to like Street Fighter too, right? It's like okay, you can if you can just think, okay, here's how to do this combo: light, light, medium, heavy attack, right? If you actually have to think about the combo, then you have to, you know, you're not thinking about which combo is the combo I want to do right now. So there are board games, as a kind of quick aside, that are sports. You might have seen us playing Jungle Speed throughout this convention. These are sports more, more so than games. There are tons of board game sports. Croc and Hole is very popular. But if you want to win at games, you have to identify, and a lot of people don't think about this, whether or not what you're playing is a sport or a game, and act accordingly. If you know it's a sport, if you know that I have to flick little things and then have mooses or elk run across them, you better practice your flicking. All right. So lesson number one, if you want to win at sports, practice. So we're not going to talk about sports anymore. We're going to use board games as examples throughout most of this because they really, the mechanics are there, physical and elegant, so that no matter, even if you're not good at math, you can see the entire game. You can manipulate it directly. You can hold the entire abstraction of the game in your mind. So they're kind of the perfect way to teach how to win at all games. I have to go over a few more definitions. Griefing is simply when you are playing to get something other than what the rest of the players are trying to get. You're not playing to win the game. If you ever play a game with anyone and you aren't trying to win, you are griefing them just as badly as if I stab my teammate in the back in Counter-Strike. Yeah, I mean, anyway, there's a thing called utility, right? Utility is what you want in the game. It's the carrot, right? Counter-Strike, you want your utility is to either, you know, let's say it's a DE map. You either want to bomb the other guys or kill them all, right? If you're trying to do something else, like, I don't want to do that, I want to jump on every crate once. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I want to find the glitch and go up above and walk on the sky. So what we have here is a mismatch of utility. I'm trying to win the game, like Herm Edwards tells me to. Scott's dicking around. My game's no longer fun. All griefing just comes down to disparate utility. Now, some games are designed better than others. For example, people grief in Counter-Strike because they're losing and they're bored. But that's a topic for another discussion. Another very important concept before we get into the actual strategies of how to beat all these games is that you have to realize all games in the world, every possible game, there is no exception to this, breaks down to one of these three in the end. 
every game is either solvable, completely random, or entirely arbitrary. Now remember, solvable doesn't mean solved, right? Solvable breaks down into solved and unsolved. Right? So there are games that are, yes, they are solvable games, but we have not yet solved them. For and example, Checkers. We talked about this in the panel we just did, but many people weren't there for that. Checkers is a solved game, relatively. There's a weak solution to Checkers in that, if from a starting position, both players can force the game to a draw no matter what. The game is solved, and eventually we will solve it completely and prove that mathematically. Someday chess will be solved. The games don't hide anything. There's a limited, finite number of possible states in the game. So the game can be solved. There's an absolute perfect way to play chess, checkers, go, oshi, tic-tac-toe, any game like that. Random. Yahtzee is a random game at its core. You are making decisions. I mean, I have to decide, all right, I rolled four sixes. Should I go for that... Fifth, six? Yeah, you could take the 24, or you can go, well, you mean if you have another roll, you're going to go for the Yahtzee. But do you score it in the four of a kind, which is a lot of points, or do you score it in the four sixes up top? Now, if you're smart at all, it's obvious what to do in Yahtzee. You're never sitting there thinking, oh, should I take the Yahtzee, or should I put it all in chance? <laughs> so the game of Yahtzee comes down to complete randomness among skilled players. Now... If you're playing with unskilled players, they're going to lose a lot because they're not playing the game perfectly. But once you are playing the game as perfectly as the decisions the game affords to you allow, the core of the game is all that matters. And in Yahtzee and Monopoly, the game is 100% random once everybody's on the same page. Settlers of Catan is a random goddamn game. <laughs> once everybody is playing Settlers the way that we will tell you how to play it, right? The winner will be determined by the roll of the dice, right? Now, because in Settlers, every turn you roll the dice to determine where resources come out. Maybe one guy is unlucky and he's on the 12 somehow, right? Well, 12 could come up like three or four times. If it happens, that guy's the win, right? Just because nobody else is going on the 12 because they're playing the odds. They're playing, you know to give themselves the best possible chance of winning, right? But every, if everyone has the best possible chance of winning, you all have the same chance, and then randomly one winner will be determined. So we played Settlers, I don't know, hundreds of times for a couple of years. This was our first German board game. We played it a lot. And we really liked it. And we got really, really good at it, and we kind of figured the game out. And I entered a national Settlers of Catan tournament. God, like at five. Ubercon. Yeah, Ubercon. Ubercon, like, five, like 03, 04. six something years ago. Yeah. I'm an old man. And at this convention, you know, I join the tournament, and I win the first round handily. I win the second round handily. We're in the quarterfinals. Everyone now is smart, just like us. We all sit down. They all know settlers. Every single game, there were four quarterfinal games, ended with one person winning with ten points, and every other person having nine and a guaranteed tenth point on their turn. There is no way any one of those players could have made the game go differently other than by sabotaging the game by not trying to win and losing on purpose. Or do a Jigaboo Jones. We'll get to Jigaboo we'll Jones, get to Jones in a little bit. Jigaboo Jones is a not guy. technically cheating. Arbitrary games. <laughs> Paper, rock, scissors is an arbitrary game. I can try to be psychological. I know Scott motherfucking loves scissors. No, nobody plays like that. Now, there is an interesting algorithm out there. It's a tic-tac-toe. It's online where you can play against it. It'll figure out how non-random you are as a human and start to beat you. But that's a separate thing. This game is entirely arbitrary. No strategy, paper, rock, or scissors, is better than any other strategy other than the dick punch followed by running away with this wall. <laughs> but that's meta play. So there's no way for me to say my choice of rock is better or worse than my, cho my choice of paper or scissors. So as a result, my decision is meaningless. You'll see players, like we said in the beginning, who haven't figured this out in much more complex games, agonizing over completely meaningless and arbitrary decisions in games. Much like our friend Physic. <laughs> he chose poorly. <laughs> so, we're going to tell you how to win some goddamn games. Let's go. We're going to tell you exactly how to win games. And we have a name for each one of these strategies. The first one, the shortest path. This might seem obvious, but people don't do it. If you play a brand new game you've never played before... Especially a very complicated German board game that has a lot going on. It's got resources, it's got money, it's got buildings, it's got, you know, little cards, it's got little animals. It's got all sorts of stuff going on, right? And you're like, ooh, I want to play with all this stuff. Ooh, look at the sheep. No, look at what gets victory points, if victory points is what you use to win. Kalis is a game where you acquire victory points. So if you look at the board, there's all these buildings you can build and all this stuff. But that whole top section is the castle. And if you put stuff in the castle, victory points come out. That is like the basic way to get victory points. 
Now, there may or may not be better ways to get victory points. I know and one guy once beat us with a jeweler. It was like an expansion yep. card, and he was able to get gold and diamonds into the jeweler, and he kicked our asses. But there is an obvious direct way to win. So if you're playing the game for the first time, and all your friends are playing for the first time, they don't realize that the shortest path is the way. They're going to play with all the stupid crap all over the board, and you just do the cheap, obvious thing that won't work necessarily against skilled players, but will work guaranteed against unskilled players. This is what you want to do when you bust open a game for the first time. Look for the victory condition, victory points, usually, in a German game like this, and go for that as hard as you possibly can. What's the easiest way to get victory points? Do it over and over and over and over and over again. Yes, I win. Puerto Rico is a good example of this. Puerto Rico is a game where you get buildings and all these victory points, but there's a captain. And it lets you take goods and turn them into victory points. If you just rush the captain and captain, 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 captain. Or craftsman to get goods, captain to sell the goods. Craftsman, captain, craftsman. Yeah, you have to do the, do the little machine crank, the smallest machine that prints out the, the With most With the highest RPMs points. you can possibly crank it. A lot of smart people like you will think, oh, but everyone knows that, so they're going to obviously do the more advanced strategy that's more likely to pay out in other situations. Others people will do the same strategy as me and dilute my victory points. Nobody does that out there. Try this. Only in the Kalis, people in this room are trying to win. Those people out there. So play know. the game Kalis with your friends, teach them the game, and just go in that goddamn castle and ignore the whole rest of the board. <laughs> now, cheap is not cheating. All right, so, so what is cheap, right? Cheap is something that's usually a game design flaw, right? Because when we look at games, we tend to think the, the most powerful strategy, right? The thing that, does, that helps you win the most should be very hard to do, right? If the card that is worth 10 victory points costs one gold, and the card that costs one, that's worth one victory point is 10 gold, that's messed up. <laughs> Because no one's ever going to buy the, 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 you know, the cheap, the expensive card, but for a few points, right? So a cheap thing is when someone screws up in game design and there's a very easy strategy, something that is incredibly simple to do and incredibly obvious, that is incredibly powerful, right? As opposed to more powerful than weaker things. Like if M. Bison's jab did more damage than the incredibly complicated ultra attack, that would be cheap and it would be a problem. So, for example, snaking. Now, in a board game, you have rules. The rules of the game define the game. As long as you do not violate the rules, you are not cheating. It is not cheating to snake because in a video game, the rules of the game are the code, and the code allows snaking. If there is ever a game that has a really cheap strategy, the game is fundamentally broken. And you if you were playing play. to win, you should be using that strategy as much as you can. The biggest stick. So if you were playing a game, and you, like, this is a good example. This is Carcassonne, and I have about an 80 90% win rate of this game. It's Yo, ridiculous. I can't even figure this game out. I don't it know is, what's going on. It is nuts. But basically, the way it works, right, is you, you know, we, we talked already about, you know, the, the, uh, the obvious strategy get victory points, right? But some games, like Carcassonne, also have ways to take away victory points from other players. So not obviously, necessarily. Not obviously, or prevent other players from getting victory points, or make it more difficult for them to get victory points, right? So when you, what you have to do is you have to think about a little bit of math, right? This move gets me five points. This move gets me three points, but it takes away six from the second best player, which makes it actually a total of nine points. So that's the better move. Because you don't care about the guy in last place. He's not going to beat you anyway. Don't spend your time dicking him. <laughs> so to win Carcassonne, every, the game is simple. You draw a card, a tile, you play it. And everyone draws one and plays one. You're very little direct, like your input to the game is very small, one tile at a time. So if there's a tile that gets you a ton of points, use that tile to get a ton of points. If you can't get more than one point with that tile and you have nothing better to do with it, find the biggest way to royally dick the person who is most likely to beat you in the game. If he's about to build a 10 point castle and you put a road pointing into it and now he never finishes that 10 point castle, you've just probably taken five points away from him. There was no way you were going to get five points just making your road one space longer. If he's got a giant city, you stick the citadel in that. It doubles the points, but it removes the condition of points if you don't finish the city. And then just make sure he never finishes that city. <laughs> the Kingmaker and the Kingbreaker. These are very important strategies in games. So in El Grande, this is a game. It's actually a great game for learning kind of all these techniques because it has almost every German-style game mechanic in it. It's an old game. You can get it for like 40 bucks. They have a box all these. In El Grande, it's kind of the Game Theory Colonel Blotto game. You're distributing your dudes all over this board. And every province has points. So like the first place guy in that province gets like five points. In Valencia. Yeah, second place gets maybe four points and third place gets like one point. Every province is different. Now in this game, the way it works is to get control of a province, you usually have to kind of work with someone else. Anytime you're getting points, you're also giving points to someone else somehow. So what you want to do is find the dumbest guy at the table and give him all the other points. 
So if me and Scott and two doofuses, not to mean that any of you are doofuses, I was pointing, <laughs> I was pointing at that guy back there, him right, yeah, him. So us and two doofuses, Scott's probably going to beat me. I know he's the best player at the table other than me. <laughs> I'm not that good at El Grande either. No. So what I'm going to do is say, rather than having a 25% chance of winning in an absolute world, maybe I have a slightly higher chance because I know I'm better than everyone else, I will split my points between myself and the two doofuses to deny Scott points. So I'll go in with those doofuses all the time. Yeah, doofus, I gave you 20 points and I got 10 for myself and Scott got nothing. Because usually in a lot of games, you know, there'll be a move available to you that gives you like 10 points and it gives no one else any points. And that's a great move, but it's pretty hard to pull off that move. It's expensive because the game doesn't have a cheap mechanic. It's not broken, right? But there's usually a lot of moves that are available that's like three for me and three for another guy or four for me and three for another guy. So you just have to choose that other guy and that other guy needs to be the worst guy the table because giving the last place guy three points it doesn't really hurt you giving the second place guy three points kills you you can't do that so what you do is you make a king you king make yeah you're not becoming the king you're making some doofus the king you're the vizier right <laughs> so you take that crappy guy you make him get second place but you get first place and he's totally buddy buddying with you without even realizing it and since he's doing so well he doesn't even think he's being a doofus to go back to carcassonne because it's a game that i think more people have played if you want a king make you and like two other, say it's a five player game, you go in with two other people and make a gigantic motherfucking city. Like something, because on your own you can't make a huge city. It's also really fun to make a big city. It is. So say me and two other guys make a gigantic city. We get like 40 points out of that. We have not gained 40 points in the game. What we've effectively done is removed 40 points from the two other people who weren't in the city. So now pretty much you two that cooperated on the city are pretty much the winners and everyone else is the losers. So now you may have to make sure that you team up with somebody else that wasn't that other guy in the castle with you so that he, you know, falls behind. Kingmaking is eliminating someone from the game, usually the person who's going to beat you otherwise. King breaking is just fairly obvious, but no one ever does it. If someone else is winning and it's not you, Attack only one! Attack him! Who, who ever seen a movie called Attack the Gas Station? Everyone go see Attack the Gas Station. You'll, All right. you'll learn to attack only one. This is our aside. Attack the Gas Station is a movie, it's Korean, about a bunch of like thugs, like you know, 16 to 20 year old punk kid thugs, who go and rob a gas station, and then they go and eat some noodles, and they're bored, and they're like, what should we now? And attack then, the Gas Station again. So they go and rob the same gas station again. <laughs> And there's one dude, there's street fights in this movie, like five or six times. And there's one guy who has a philosophy. If there's ever a fight, no matter how many people I'm fighting, I pick one guy and I attack only one guy. Because if you try to fight a mob of guys, right, maybe they'll hold you down, maybe you'll do a little bit of damage to all of them. If you pick just one, you're sending that guy to the hospital big time. And now everyone is afraid of you. Right? There's this so great scene. you come, a group of people comes at you, right, and you're like, attack only one. And they're like, I hope I'm not the one. And they all run away. <laughs> It's kind of like Sean Connery in the back of a prison, in, in the, the prison truck in the family business, where he, you know, he looks around, who's the biggest, baddest dude in this room, and headbutts him and knocks him out. Same exact thing. So if you ever go to prison, attack on the wall. <laughs> left, right. This is the idea that the, sit, the order of play, which usually in games is clockwise. If it's a weird game, like a Steve Jackson game, it's counterclockwise. Sometimes it's random, but whatever the turn order is matters a lot. Right, I mean, tic-tac-toe, you want to be X. You don't want to be O. O is no good. So we played El Grande a lot. That was our first real game after Settlers of Catan. And we started to figure the game out. We started to figure out that there's this state that the game gets into, like four rounds before the end, that determines who wins. Absolutely. So everyone jockeyed to make the first move four rounds before the end, and then we didn't even need to play after that. So people realized that because you bid around clockwise, sitting to the left of a dumbass gave you a much better chance of pulling that off. Now, in, in many games like Puerto Rico, the example is that play goes around clockwise. You never want to be doing the same thing as the person who goes before you, because he will always front run you. If I'm trying to craft and captain, and Scott's trying to craft and captain... It's like craft... Captain. So I get the benefits of his crafting, and he doesn't get it because I got the captain. He did all the work, I get the payoff. Now, in other games, you want to look at... Like, say there's multiple paths to victory. Like, you can go for the gold, or you can go for the brick and wood. 
If someone else is already going for the brick and wood, you don't want to do the same thing they're doing, even if they don't go before you necessarily, because if two people are competing for the same scarce resources, neither one of you is more likely to win. In fact, you're- Power grid, if one guy's doing the coal power plant, don't do the coal power plant. You got to do the oil or the trash or something else, because otherwise he's going to buy up all the coal and it's going to become really expensive. So you have to pay attention to who goes before you, who goes after you. You have to decide what is my strategy. You have to, you want to pick a strategy that either no one else is doing or that you can front run the doofus to your left on. You, know, you also, uh, when you're about to sit down to play a game, you want to fight for, you know, musical chair situation. Yeah, El Grande got bad. It got to the point where I'd sit down and Scott would get up and move. Then I would get up and move. Scott would get up and move. <laughs> if you have to, if everyone is smart, start determining seating randomly or play a different game. This is also why. If read any German game. People forget to read the wholeness of the book. In every German game, it says how to determine the starting player. It'll say something like the youngest player, the oldest player, the whoever fattest player. Whoever is closest to water, whoever's been in Italy most recently. <laughs> you should use those rules because otherwise, someone smart who realizes that if I go first in this game, I'm more likely to win. If I go last in this game, I'm more likely to win. They'll just say, oh, you guys can go first. Yeah. So what you should do if you're playing Puerto Rico, three player, always go last. We're, I'm pretty sure that if everyone plays optimally, the third player in a three-player game of Puerto Rico will, four or five player, only three. will always win. Always. That corn helps a whole lot. We've played Puerto Rico like 100, 200, 300 times over the course of one summer. Five or six times every damn day. No one ever won unless they were the third place player. Brinksmanship. So this isn't the greatest game, but... Who has played this game? Chrononauts? Oh, right. good. Okay, so in this game, there's something that can happen with the paradoxes, right? If there's too many paradoxes, like 13 paradoxes, the whole game will end in a horrible, horrible universe-destroying fashion. And everybody loses. Everybody loses. Everybody. So everyone's score at winning is zero, as opposed to I win, my score is one, and everyone else's score is zero. So say you're one away from the paradox that ends the game. There's no reason for you to ever fix that. Because if no one else fixes it, you all lose. You're no worse off than everyone else. If you fix it, you're denying yourself points, making sure that you don't win, just so some other doofus can win the game. Yeah, I mean, it costs an action, it costs resources to fix this problem that's a shared problem among everybody, right? It's the tragedy of the commons, right? Oh man, you know, this park is really dirty. The park belongs to everybody. If I clean up the park, I'm spending my hour of, you know, time cleaning it. I get to spend my hour in the park. He gets to spend his hour enjoying the clean park that I cleaned up, right? So, I mean, in real life, that doesn't work, right? You want to have a clean park. It's good to clean up the but park. This but this is trying a to win, game. You don't want to be the guy who spent your in-game money to fix something that's a problem for everybody because then you're just now behind by X dollars and now you're going to lose. You don't care if this universe gets destroyed. You don't care about that at all. You care about winning that game. <laughs> now, this, this applies. Brinksmanship applies to a lot of systems. For example, let's say Scott's going to win on his turn. Like when it is his turn, he wins unless someone blocks one action in the game by putting their dude there. If, say, me and one other person are the last players to go... I will never block Scott from winning unless I will force the other guy to do it. Because if I say, no, I'm not going to do it, he is obligated to or the game ends and he loses. He will probably do it because otherwise Scott's guaranteed to win the game ends right then. And I have now not had to do it, so I'm more likely to win. So if ever, you know, you're playing in your group and someone says something like, we got to stop for him or he's totally going to win, let somebody else do it. In fact, point at someone else and say, if you don't do it, we're going to lose because fuck you, I'm not doing anything. <laughs> And you tell them the exact move, too. Be like, you, on your turn, you're going to put your thing there. Otherwise, it's 100% sure. Look, this and this and this and this room will win. I'm definitely not going to do it. You must do it. <laughs> right? Let them know. Because otherwise, they might be not, if they're not too smart, they might not realize that this is going on. It's basically a cold war. You've got nukes, so you don't care. You're just like, all right, I'll lose. Bring it. <laughs> so psychology, reading, you know, reading faces, reading minds, this is actually very important in games. Now, if you are smart players... Don't, just don't reveal anything. Don't, you know, have a poker face. Wear sunglasses, wear a ski mask, do whatever you gotta do. <laughs> we had a problem. Behind shield. There's a game, Tigris and Euphrates. It's one of our, uh, Puerto Rico is the best German game ever designed. Tigris and Euphrates is my favorite game ever. And in this game, you have tiles of four different colors behind the little screen. The tiles are hidden behind your shield. No one is supposed to know what tiles you have or how many. For a while, I was winning an inordinate number of these games against Scott. And the reason for this was I would hold my tiles like a hand, like a poker hand. So they were just in a little hand of little tiles. I kept a little pile behind my shield. I noticed that every time Scott had three or more, if the color came up, he would, he would look down and he would go like this from the top and grab that pile. 
So I knew whenever he came in from the top, he had three or more of that tile most of the time. If he came in from the side, he had two or less. <laughs> it worked really, really well. I learned my lesson. I learned so my lesson. Scott learned his lesson. And he, you know, he was able to avoid that. But your friends are not as smart as you because you now know. Watch your friends. If you're playing Stratego, just watch what they set up. They're going to put the flag down first. Yeah, or like I'm playing Ticket to Ride, right? So I'm playing, and I'm like, huh, is, is he going to, you know, I'm worried. Like, I want to build those tracks, but it's going to take me two turns. Is he going to build those tracks there first? Look at the dude's eyes. Look at where they're aiming on the board. People look at the spot that they're going to make a move. So if you can look at them and look at the board and see where they're looking, that's where they're making a move. So it's like, oh, he's looking at California. I'm safe. I can wait a turn to go to New York. Oh, shit, he's looking at New York. Make the move now. El Grande was where we really figured this out because it has secret spinners. It has a mechanic where everyone will pick a province on a secret spinner and reveal them simultaneously. So because the provinces all have names, look at everyone's eyes and they'll be looking at it and they'll be like, and they'll zoom in because they can't read it because everyone has bad eyes. Oh, Valencia. Yeah. And you'll know, all right, they're going to go to Valencia. So. There's actually one game. It's not a great game, but it does have some cool stuff in it that actually solves this problem. Fury of Dracula is a game where Dracula is hidden movement. He's secretly moving around Europe, right? And the thing is, you would think Dracula will look at the map, and then you'll know where Dracula is because he's looking at where he is because he wants to know where he can go. The game actually comes with a separate little mini-map that Dracula can look at like this so that Dracula will not reveal his position by looking at the big map. We have tried. There's almost no way to figure out where someone's looking. So if you're Dracula, make sure you're looking at the little map. Never look at the big one ever. <laughs> also, you know, do tricks. Say the name of a province. Say the name of a strategy. Try to draw out what the other people are doing. Most people are not that good at this and will totally reveal what's going on. And you also, you got to play the double up game, right? If, you, if you're going to go to New York, look at California a whole bunch. I hope that, right? Because someone else will be like, oh, he's definitely going over there. Once they see you look in there, and they just be like, uh, and then make your move over to the right. Now, more importantly, and this is probably one of the biggest pieces of advice we can give you. Whenever a decision is random or arbitrary, actually act randomly. Citadels is an arbitrary game. It's a poison in the cup game, but it's really fun. I'd recommend it. But the way the game works is you have a set of cards that determine the role you're going to take. And there's a lot of psychology as to who's going to take what role. For example, there's a role that lets you build a whole bunch of crap. So if someone has a whole bunch of money, they really want that role. There's another role that steals all the money from whoever you want, meaning the guy who has a whole bunch of money who's going to build a whole bunch of crap. So if I play the thief on, and, I, and when I play the thief, I say, I'm robbing the builder. If Scott had taken the builder, I get all his money. He can't build anything. So people would, you could never take the good cards because people knew you were going to take the good cards. It was just a poison cup situation. So Scott did a very meta play thing. One game, he's holding up the cards. He puts them down, shuffles them, cuts the deck, picks one randomly, doesn't even look at it, and passes them to the left. <laughs> we never played Citadels again. <laughs> right? They're trying to guess, oh, did he take the merchant or is he playing it safe taking the magician? I don't even know what I took. <laughs> In the rock, paper, scissors, this isn't arbitrary. You should pick randomly, right? And that way, no one will be able to guess what you're doing, and you'll have the best odds of winning. Now, in this game, Scott did something that is so close to cheating, it's it wasn't painful. Cheating, but, so what I did is I realized these morons weren't shuffling the cards. So I fanned out the cards in my hand, and I num they were numbered, so it was 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 8. I selected one, right? I, I folded them up, and I handed them to the next guy. And I go... He fanned them out. He took the third one. <laughs> Pete didn't shuffle him either, so it's like he took the sixth one. All right. That one, that one round, that one game, Scott was like Neo in the Matrix, and the rest was like, "What the fuck is going on?" Like, Grim, you just took the thief. Pete, you just took the merchant. They're like, what? <laughs> That specific trick, I guarantee, will work on all your friends. So buy Citadels. And you play Citadels, shuffle the cards before you draw, even if you're not drawing randomly. Just shuffle them up. Behind your back if you have to. So, meta play. Now, we're using the colloquial definition, not the game theory definition like we were using in the previous panel. So I'm going to use the same example I used. So I'm sorry to the people who were there. Say we're going to play chicken. You know, the game where we're both in cars. We're going to drive at each other at 100 miles an hour. If I swerve and Scott doesn't, he wins. Oh, yeah. If he swerves and I don't, I win. If we both swerve, we both lose. If neither one of us swerves, we both die. 
Oh, I almost did it. Damn it. All right. So there is a way to win this game. So we're sitting there. We're ready to go. I look at Scott. He looks at me. I rip my steering wheel off and throw it out of my car. Now, what if we both do it at the same time? So, so the real game of chicken is who rips out their steering column first. See, well, I, I got a secret wrench hidden under the dash. I... So then it comes down to all the facts. So think about that. The game, my, his decision matrix was swerve or not swerve, and there were you know, multiple possible outcomes. His decisions now are swerve or die. Because <laughs> I already know that he is locked in to not swerve, just like we were talking about you know, the, 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 the blocking of the other guy you know is going to win, right? I know that he is not going to prevent our friend from winning the game. Therefore, it's up to me because he threw a steering wheel at me. You can do this in any game where you pick rolls or cards. You can take a card and say, I'm playing this one and throw it down and that's it. Like, like, I'm not going back. There's no way for me to undo my move. You can also do it very subtly and very cheaply in games like Vinci, which was remade as Small World. This only works over the course of multiple games, though. Yes. And this is cheap and meta, but it's worked really well for me and it'll work really well for you. You play Small World or Vinci. Once you decline your empire... Then you get a new empire and you bust out out of the board, usually on top of someone else's business. So every time that would happen, someone's about to come on, I turn to them and say, if you take so much as one of my properties, I will spend my entire next round utterly fucking you. And do it. Even if it costs you a whole lot, do it anyway. If you make a threat, follow through on the threat. Now maybe that would cost you so much that you wouldn't win. Okay, but we told you to play to win. The thing is, in the next game, they know that you are serious and you are not lying when you make these threats. <laughs> and then they won't, they won't go after your declining empire because it'll make them lose. And then you'll keep the declining empire and then you come on top of them anyway and you know, you'll get doubled. You can, al- you can also use psychology here in a great way. Just like I, people, I have a reputation among our friends of just lying about 50% of the time. <laughs> so we'll be playing Jungle Speed, and I'll just be like, colors, there's a match. Aren't you going to grab it? And there's no matches. But sometimes there is a match, and I say that, and people who had a match look at it like, and then I just grab the top. Like it, you were like, you know, just be a jerk all the time. <laughs> so we promised we'd teach you how to beat two games very specifically. And if we have time, maybe we'll talk about another game, but the first one we want to do is Stratego. We can tell you exactly how Everyone to beat... Everyone knows how to play Stratego, right? Is anyone not familiar with the game of Stratego? Uh, A few good. people. All right, so that's tough. basically, we'll pull up the, the actual board. So there are some certain, you know, among players who aren't that great at this game, who haven't solved it, there's a lot of strategies and tactics that don't exist in higher levels of play. For example, when I play against doofuses, I'll say they're next to my bomb. I'll pick up my bomb and go like I'm going to attack him, and then I'll change my mind and put it back down. Now, a smart player, that won't won't work against me. If you didn't move it, you didn't move it. See, when I play, the number one thing you got to do in Stratego is never, ever, ever attack anything that has not moved. If you know it is moved, then it is not a bomb, and you can attack it. If it is not moved, absolutely do not attack it whatsoever under any circumstance. There's no reason to ever, ever do that. Now, secondarily, you never ever put your one piece, your most powerful guy, next to a piece you have not identified. Because it might be a spy. There is no reason to ever risk your one piece. So never, ever, ever, ever put him next to a piece you don't know what it is. It seems simple. People don't think of these yeah, things. You lose your one piece and the other guy still has it, game over. Let's talk about setup. Most people put all their scouts in the front. That seems like an obvious strategy. That is the worst thing you can do. Because they're guaranteed to die against anything. You want so to it, save your scouts in the second row so that they can go, and after you clear out the guys in the front lines, you can see what's in the back, and that's how you find the bombs. Or more importantly, that's how you find the spot. You have a line of scouts in the third row just waiting, because they can attack across the whole board. Anytime an unidentified piece comes out moving towards your one, hit it with the spy. Or, sorry, hit scout. it with the scout. You would not believe how many spies I have caught by that. And once you have taken out the other guy's spy... You're basically invincible. Because once the other guy knows where your one is, and your one isn't dead because you didn't put it next to any unknown pieces, right? So you, once your one, once they know where it is, they'll start trying to move the spy towards it, especially if it's far away. So what do you put in the front row? Maybe a bomb, but most importantly, you put in the front row all your goons. I mean, your one pieces, two pieces, three pieces are important. We're talking about the five, six, seven guys. Right? Every piece that isn't a one, two, three scout, spy, or minor is completely worthless. So put the highest number, or lowest number, depending on what set you have, the best of your goons, all in the front. 
and your friends you're playing with are going to just ram all their scalps against it and lose all their scalps. That works almost all the time. The other, so, the other thing is like, you know, okay, so you got these pretty much three columns because there's two lakes, right? So it's like where you got to send a big army up one or two of the columns and you got to hide the bomb somewhere back there, right? First of all, hide the bomb randomly, right? That way there's no way the guy can psychologically figure it out. Don't like when you're setting up the board, right? Some people just, they set it up like one piece at a time. They're probably going to put the flag first. So watch, flag, watch how bomb, they bomb. the board. Here's my one piece. Then they put all the bombs like spread out and then they fill in. All the pieces they put toward the end are their goons because you'll see them just kind of putting them all over the place kind of semi-arbitrarily you know that's where the goons are watch them set up and place your pieces deliberately and pretty randomly now we're going to teach you how to beat unskilled players because that's what you're interested in no one out there is really good at stratego i call this bombs and bullshit <laughs> put your flag in the bottom left corner or bottom i say right corner. usually bottom left because people read left to right usually so but as a result, they expect people to play or left Chinese to right. Game. So you're going to play to the fact that they have these sort of preconceived notions about the way the game's going to go. Just put your flags and bombs around it. Put all your best guys on your left side in front of the bomb. Your one, your two, your three, all your miners, everything. The entire rest of your board is bombs and bullshit. <laughs> on your turn, just move all your big guys up around the left in a big circle. Just come, oh, there we go, all the way up around. And if he comes in this way, just come back and stop him. There's no way he'll get to your flag. All your best pieces are blocking it. This will beat any eight-year-old kid in the world, and he'll have no <laughs> idea what you did it. Now, the thing is, what if you are playing this game and they're both following our advice? What will happen? The game is rock, paper, scissors, all right? I happen to put my flag here, you happen to put it there, so just the slight differences in our setup, we could have if we had some good sort of culture calculator. Just flip over all our pieces, look at both boards, and say, you would have won. Because it is a good option. I put my flag there, undefended, because I figured you'd miss it in my senior rooms. Maybe not, maybe it. It's sort of the same thing happens a lot with, you know, a lot of clickable like card games. But instead of actually playing, or like Yu Gi Oh! especially, or like, you know, Pokemon. Yeah, I can't just flip over your decks, spread them out, and you'll say, yeah, that's never going to be the stack up. I can't just <laughs> did legitimately win. Well, to be fair, it was a little bit. They legitimately won a UBF tournament at Millennium Games in Rochester, New York, when we were at the college. They said they took this hand with the Nilco. And it's like the game store, say, all the best cards. They made the best possible deck. They made the million dollar deck. Every great card that was legal to play. And they wrote down the rules of the hand of hope. What you do is draw a card and play that card with the book. They beat everybody. <laughs> now, in Stratego, when we said it's paper, rock, scissors, when you're playing the game, you can make it not paper, rock, scissors for other people, but it's still paper, rock, scissors for you. You shouldn't be making decisions during the game. For any possible thing that can happen, there's for you, there will be an obvious move. Duh, I do this. Say he's not that many pieces left, like he's already beat him, he's just trying to play. Just wait, don't go like trying to find his bombs. He has to move a piece. As soon as he moves a piece, just surround him and hit him. He has to move another one. <laughs> Extent information in the game is very important. If there are numbers there, remember them. Count cards. Count cards is not cheating. It's just really, really cheap. This club, and also, right, so you need to absolutely remember where the one is, where the two is. But at the same time, make the other guy forget, then shell move. Spend a few turns just moving the one and the two around. So be like, well, I'm going to move my one piece at you, and you move the three, right? He doesn't know. Move your guys in a big circle for a while for no reason. <laughs> Now, he is, he is legitimately able to say, what did you move? Because he has to know what you move. He said, yeah, I know that piece. He will probably have forgotten what that piece was. Because of this weird psychology of he didn't see you move. The <laughs> uh, best thing I hear about Stratego, if you do the bombs and bullshit strategy, you'll be almost anywhere outside of this room. And if someone else is doing the bombs and bullshit strategy, you're just going to make rock scissors now, and it's still a good game. You'll know you've solved it when you don't make any decisions in the course of the game.